Thank you for auditing the Always Positive New Music Review Show hosted by a French professor who's going to be doing a review of the new album When God Was Great by the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones, but this is going to be a slightly different video. It's going to be a little bit more like the kind of videos I make for my Patreons, patreon.com backslash Professor Sky. And the reason why is that it's not going to be an entirely positive review. It's going to be more of an essay asking this question. How do we forgive bands that we used to love and then hated? Do you have a band like this? Please, I'm very serious, please put this in the comments. If you had this experience of at some point in your youth, loving a band, having it be everything in your whole life, and then hating that band to the point where you just don't want anything to do with it. See, they did release this album this week and my brother oddly asked me if I would review it. But the main reason I want, I want to talk about the Boss is because, I'm talking like Christopher Walken, the reason I want to talk about the, the Boss is while I was looking around for old family photos for my last video, I came across this picture of a 14-year-old Professor Sky. This is the Professor Sky who was, at that point, getting a D in his high school French class. This was the Professor Sky who was crippled by self-doubt, insecurity, who looked an awful lot like Lena Dunham. And you'll see that I am wearing my brand new Mighty Mighty Boston shirt. You can actually see the date on the picture back when they used to do that, February 1992. And you see this kid got to see the Boston's the night that they released their second album. Uh, and that moment was like one of the great music moments of my life. It was transformative. I saw this punk adjacent ska band from my hometown, from Boston. And I just thought they were the coolest possible thing you could imagine. This kid right here is got so into music. Okay, yeah, my brothers love music and I was following them, but the Boston's were sort of my first band where it's like, this is my band. These are what, this is my identity. So I got into a ska phase. I got into other Boston ska bands like Bim Scala Bim, who are also still around. I got so into the Boston's, I think I saw them like five times in one year. I even took a train with my friend Brad down to New York City at 14 years old and saw them perform in New York. Brad's sister Sarah lived in the apartment where the lead singer Dickie Barrett's girlfriend lived. And we left a note on the door that said, great show tonight. And he wrote back, thanks. And the next morning I saw it and I have not been that excited. I, you know, I'd never been that excited. That was like my brush with greatness. I bought their EPs. They were basically all I listened to. My band when we started was a ska band. We called ourselves the long haired hippie freaks. Even though none of us had long hair and none of us were hippies. We were 14. But what happened? What happened to this kid wearing this Boston shirt and loving the Boston so much? I grew up. I realized the ska phase wasn't for me. By the time 1994 hit and they had something of an actually successful song on the Clueless soundtrack, I hated them. I didn't even buy their third album. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I wouldn't have seen them for free. And you know, there's a, there's a couple of thoughts about this. First of all, ska is an interesting genre for this. Um, I think ska is a little bit like emo in the way that people get into it in high school, but it has a shelf life. Like, can anybody like ska music for more than three consecutive years? <laughs> Please tell me. I don't mean the specials, okay? The specials are, they're just a great band, right? But can anyone like, like, like you know, wear the jackets and the pins and be a, a root boy, ska person for more than three consecutive years. I don't think so. Well, I was in college and I met a guy who was like one year older than me and he was still in a ska phase. And I remember thinking like, ooh, that's a, that's a bad, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a uh, selector, yeah, it's, it's great, cool jacket. <laughs> cool. It just kind of felt sad. But how do we forgive these bands, you know? It, it's funny because when I think about the way that I felt about the boss tones, looking at it, it's a, it's, a, it's a question of growth, okay? So like when I was a kid, the thing I loved more than anything were the Boston Bruins, okay? The Boston Bruins hockey team were everything. To the point where I was getting personalized autographs from should-be Hall of Famer Stevie Casper. You know, like that was everything. But I grew out of it, you know, that whole thing about, you know, uh, when you're a child, you put away your toys to try to become a man. And that's what I did with music. You know, 
I sold my Michael Jordan rookie card for $200 and I used that $200 to buy a base. And I bought a base primarily because I was inspired by Joe Gittleman, the bass player for the Mighty Mighty Boston's. So it was this whole process that I was going through and that we all go through, you know, where you get rid of your toys, get rid of your fascination with, you know, hostile Canadians, you know, like where you just kind of grow up and music is one of the ways that you do it. And so I think there's this weird thing when you grow out of music where like you hate it because it's a reminder of how young you were. It's a reminder of your inexperience. Oddly enough, right after the Boston's, I became a giant Grateful Dead fan, like trading tapes and everything. And I don't listen to the Grateful Dead now either. <laughs> like at a certain point in my youth, music stuck and I loved it. But there was this weird fanaticism and the Boston's were, they were the ones who received it. This kid right here, I don't know if my life was saved by the Boston's, but they might have been. They meant so much to me. I don't care if their music was silly odes to getting drunk and just being jerks from Boston, you know? Like, it was so important to me. And I have not intentionally listened to the Mighty Mighty Boston's since at least 1994. I've heard them, you know? They, did, they play the soundtrack for the podcast of Adam Carolla. This is amazingly well-themed because I feel very similar about Adam Carolla <laughs> as I feel about the Mighty Mighty Boston's. Now, I do have pretty left-leaning political views, and Adam Carolla has become something of a right-wing mouthpiece, which is weird and sad. I don't think he's been good for the last five years. I stopped listening to his show. But, you know, I, I bought his book. I got super into it. I will acknowledge without irony that he is absolutely one of the smartest human beings on Earth in terms of his quickness and his humor and his ability to draw connections and tell a story and read people. Like, he's amazing. But still, like, to think about how much I used to listen to Adam Kroll at just 10 years ago is kind of embarrassing to me. We just keep on growing, and then we keep on having contempt for the things that we have outgrown. And I don't think this is fair, so that's why I'm reviewing When God Was Great by the Mighty Mighty Boston's. I can't just, you know, try to like, okay, what's Arca about, you know? What's all this new music that I don't understand? How about this music that I do sort of understand, that's, that's kind of grown up, that, you know, that I've grown past? One of the biggest questions is, why did my brother ask me to review this? You see, I'm seeing him today. He lives six hours away and his son's graduating from college. Congratulations. So I'm gonna go see him. But the funny thing is, he was the one who suggested in a comment, he comments on my videos sometimes and watches them, uh, said, hey, are you gonna review the new Boston's? And I thought, like, I think he might be making fun of me because he was part of the reason I gave up on the Boston's. He said, it must have been in 1994, um, I respect the Mighty Mighty Boston's, but they don't know how to write songs. And I remember being like, what are you talking about? This they do. They're the best. Awfully quiet. Come on. They're the, they abs look for the swan boats in Mattapan. I find that damn amusing. This is the greatest band of all time. But that planted the seed. And then as I started to learn more about music and songwriting, eh, maybe there was, he was more right than wrong. But what are the Boston's? The thing I'll say is they're not different now than they were then. Like, I overestimated how good they were when, when I was this guy. And then when I was like 20 years old, you know, five years old than that guy, I underestimated them. Because they really are quite an interesting band. They have a very charismatic lead singer, Dickie Barrett. You know, he has a great growl and a good voice. His voice is holding strong despite the cigarettes and years. A great horn section that they use very well and quite sparingly. The thing about ska music is it's very formulaic, but at least this album and their former stuff kind of stays a little bit away. Like it does, it's not boring ska. I mean, yeah, you have the guitar and the off beats and you have the horns and you have the pick them up, pick them up, pick them up kind of sound. But in general, it works quite nicely. And then we get back to the reason that I sold my Michael Jordan rookie card for $200. I got out of a pack, it's okay. It's worth around 10 grand now. And bought a, a Fender Precision Bass. Uh, was that like, the bass player for the Mighty Mighty Boston's is one of the most underrated musicians in music. Like he is an amazing bass player. He does tons of work. He writes great lines. He keeps things together. He's lost in the shuffle of of the rest of the music, of the rest of the sound, but he's really great. 
Now, I pay a lot of attention to him because I guess he went to school with my other brother. Like, because, you know, we're all Boston area. It's very kind of, New England's pretty small. So, like, I had that kind of personal connection and I knew that he happened to be a nice person in real life. But it was really cool. Like, he's a really, really good bass player. And despite the fact that ska isn't for everybody, it's worth listening. So while I was driving my daughter to school, I was listening to this music and she was kind of laughing at me. But I, I played their, their, their second album for her and I tried to explain to her like, I have to be honest, I've seen a lot of concerts. But the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones in 1992, if I'm being honest, is one of the best shows I've ever seen. Did I see Nirvana on their last tour? Yeah, I did. Were the Boston's better than Nirvana? A thousand times better than Nirvana. The mighty, mighty Boston's were a thousand times better than Nirvana. A million times better. That, the energy that they have on stage with their plaid and the one dude whose job is just to dance and the mosh pit and the horns and the screaming, I feel, I feel bad. I feel bad for the fact that I have been crapping on this band for <clears throat> so much of my life, for the majority of the time that I've talked about them, because they were able to do something really quite incredible, and based on what I hear on this album, they are still basically doing it. Now this album was lighter than I expected, but in kind of a good way. It's quite poppy. I don't know if that's kind of good or bad. It, it's sort of soft rock. <laughs> Yacht Rock for Rude Boys. That's a line that I wrote. I don't know if it's too too snarky. But what do I want? You know? Like, okay, so other Boston bands like Dinosaur Jr. and the Pixies, you know, they stay true and they innovate and their new music is just as challenging and just as cool as their old music. Yeah, well, the Boston's were never like that. The Boston's were never that cool. So it makes sense that their music now is similarly not as cool as they weren't actually that cool as I thought they were back then. For homework, my example song is going to be the track Bruised, which I'll put a link to up there. You know, it's just a nice ska song, beautiful, beautiful horn work, great bass, and the thing that this song has that the Boston's I think have developed well is in that early stuff, you know, to me, I was listening to it for the parts where I would mosh, you know, where I'd slam dance, where I would skank. I, I, I never called it skank. I never actually got fully into ska. I basically just liked the Boston's and everything else was like, eh. Um, which, by the way, if you want to piss off a ska fan, tell them you only like the Boston's. It's, it's, like, it's like meeting a hip hop. It's like when I was in high school, I had a friend, Dave, and he said, the only hip hop group I like is G-Love and Special Sauce. <laughs> it's just still the funniest sentence I've ever heard. I'm sorry. If you know you love in special sauce, that's a very funny sentence. Um, but still, just they have just, instead of this like looking for the mosh pit point, they just have a great groove. And all the way throughout this album, they're able to hit these great grooves. It's on the back of the bass player and the horns working so nicely together, but they really have it. And then the lyrics on this song are very typical of the whole album. It's about being old. The whole album is about being old. It's about being old and young people being stupid. And I like this. Do you want to know why I like this? Because the early music was about being young and old people being stupid. That's the cycle of the bourgeoisie that keeps going. You know, when you're young, you see bourgeois pigs and you make fun of them. And then you become old and you become a bourgeois pig and then you look down on them. There's a great Jacques Brel song about that, which I'll talk about sometime on this channel. That's the way it should be. So this whole, the, the, you know, they're just like, we might be bruised, but we're not broken. We're still doing it. I'm doing a lot of that today. The rest of the album I'll go through fairly quickly. Decide opens up, very good horns again, very simple singing, very catchy. It reminded me of a lot of other pop songs, but I couldn't figure out which ones. Move is a nice song of togetherness. We're in this all together. A little bit more gentle ska, like Dickie is actually sort of singing. Um, next track is called I Don't Believe in Anything. A nice drum line beginning, but it's not so good. Certain Things uh, is interesting because it starts with a like talking with the pedal steel, it's not really ska. It's like kind of like country-ish. So it's nice, you know, they are developing a little bit. They are doing different things. Cause it's a weird thing. How, how are you an old ska band? Cause ska requires young people caring about ska music. So how are you an old ska band? I guess you have to evolve somewhat. I guess you have to become Yacht Rock for Rude Boys. Um, 
Bru uh, then, then we get to Bruised, which I've already just discussed. And then we get to another highlight on the album, Lonely Boy. Um, this is really cool because it's kind of a gentle ska song, you know, which wasn't their strength before. But here it's really cool because it's about being lonely and going down to Kingston. And you're thinking, oh, ska? Are they really trying to say that they're going down to Kingston, Jamaica? No, <laughs> they're going to Kingston, Massachusetts. It's a place on the, on the shore in, in uh, Massachusetts. I've never been there. I grew up in Massachusetts. Never been there. It's amazing how few places I've been to in Massachusetts, despite growing up there. Uh, you know, but there's like the sounds of seagulls and he's lonely. And it really reminded me mostly of Quadrophenia. It has that feeling of like when I was young, I was lonely and alienated. Squ Squadrophenia? Squadrophenia? I don't know what it is, but this album, uh, it, they could have almost committed to it. Because there's so many songs on it about youth and when things were great. I almost think that would be a neat idea. What if the Boston's released a Quadrophenia style album about their youth in Massachusetts with their new kind of light ska? I think that'd be good. The next track, by the, by the way, Lonely Boy, I love that song. I love it unironically. I don't have to square it with myself. I don't have to say it is a good for a Boston song. It's just a good song. And I'm very happy that my brother is convincing me to listen to it. Is that why? Is he doing it because he has now grown and realizes that they are a good band? You never stop learning from your older brothers. Uh, next track is called The Killing of Georgie Part 3. <sighs> okay. So, you know, I'm a chronicler of the 2020s. I don't mean to be, but I am. And this is a song about George Floyd's death, the man who was killed by the police officer last year. But it's also a parody of a Rod Stewart song. The Killing of Georgie, part one and two. That just makes it a sort of fever dream of 2020. Like, is this, a, is this, Georgie, please stay. They took your breath away. It's not what we were hoping for. It's not what we need. I still have a dream rooted in the American dream. <laughs> like These really earnest lyrics about police brutality and Rod Stewart. It's like, it's like, if you think I'm sexy, parentheses, Black Lives Matter, right? Also, if you could write a song called, If You Think I'm Sexy, Black Lives Matter, that would also be good. You Had to Be There is the most old man song you've ever heard. It's just old guys from Boston talking about how great Boston used to be. I do have news for you. I've been back to Boston. It sucks. Boston was a great place to grow up in the 80s and 90s, but it is just a... A biotech nightmare. There's no good stores anymore. There's no good anything. Everything's just priced out. Everything sucks. Everyone should move to Rochester. Rochester is like Boston used to be in the 80s and 90s. So I can relate to this kind of like you had to be there, but it's 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 comically old thing to say. There's nothing to compare to it. It was madness and magic and we had to have it. But you know, they talk about the Rat, the famous club in Kenmore Square where I used to go. I saw a Sam Black Church concert there once with Slapshot, another great Boston punk band. And you know, this is where you kind of get that sense, the kind of yacht rock for aging Xers, yacht rock for, for, for old punks, you know. Then we get to the next track, When God Was Great. And this is where the sort of nostalgia takes a bad turn. I don't know. It's looking back at his neighborhood and there's a saxophone and it is very unpleasant. I do not like this song at all. Get to the next track, What It Takes very, like, uh, Dickie Barrett has his way of writing lyrics that is just comically bad, to the point where you wonder if it's satire of bad lyrics. Um, and often the titles are like that, like, The Truth Hurts, What It Takes, uh, Move, Certain certain Things is the most Boston's title of a song I've ever heard. <laughs> like, it doesn't really quite say anything. Um, but still, it's an okay song. Uh, moving on to Long As I Can See the Light. Another kind of downbeat, nice song. I think it pairs well with Lonely Boy. All about this, uh, the pedal steel. That's kind of a nice sort of end of life song. I don't know. But it's it's actually a very nice touching song. I'm happy to see, coming back to the Boston's, that they are capable of doing good, meaningful, slow songs. The next song is The Truth Hurts. I mean, think about how many of these songs are about like being old. You know, you had to be there when God was great. Uh, long as I can see the light, then the truth hurts. It's about like someone older talking about wisdom, which is an okay song. It reminds me a little bit too much of John Cougar Mellencamp with the way it uses claps. At times, this album reminds me of They Might Be Giants and Weird Al as well, which is odd. I, 
I don't know. It Went Well is maybe the best song on the album. Kind of heartwarming, cool ska guitar, good percussion, beautiful horn break, and the lyrics are all about like staying with somebody. A piano solo, a harmonica solo. Then the next track, I Don't Want to Be You, <laughs> which they should have just called this anti-social media. It is absolute extra cringe about like your followers must be counted. Like just a super old dude, like there's a place in hell waiting for you, Instagram influencer. <laughs> Still, though, nice piano details, kind of a police-ish pre-chorus. And then we get to the last track, The Final Parade, an eight-minute song, which you never would expect. And it's kind of nice. It's just sort of like a sort of like a, a nice ending to an album. It seems to be about like his life and the past and about someone who let the merry-go-round go more than anyone should, which is a good lyric, legitimately good lyric. Um, an oddly long song, which I like. You know, there's a lot of nice parts, too, with just the voice and the horns. And they go back to talking about more places in the now dead Boston, you know, Central Square, which used to be nice and now sucks. TT the Bears, which used to be a great club and is now closed. The Middle East, which I think is still there. I played the Middle East once. They had a scam where if you were a band, you could play there once because they knew you'd bring your whole family. And then if you asked to play a second time, I don't think it's gonna work. So there we go. There is my trip down memory lane with Adam Carolla and the Bruins and the Bostones, and my friend Brad, and this little kid here. So do please tell me, is there an example you can think of of a band that you loved more than anything that you then hated? And have you revisited their music? And can you forgive yourself? Can you forgive them? All right, till next time, there's the camera.